So welcome everybody uh, as we move in away from the cookies. So um, as always, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to the uh, monthly APS colloquium. Uh, it's a special privilege today because we have a, um, what for me is actually a very distinguished speaker today, uh, Mark Sutton, who's the James McGill Professor of Physics at McGill University. Uh, everybody knows, or most people will know Mark. He's been a longtime synchrotron user, uh, really one of the pioneers of, uh, of uh, XPCS as a technique within the light source community. Uh, somebody who's been deeply involved at the APS since its inception, and I think there are probably components with your name still on them somewhere on the floor. Uh, Mark is also uh, currently the chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee for the APS, so he's somebody who's not only been a user, but has some, been somebody who's been deeply involved in uh, helping the APS steer its course over the last several years. Uh, in terms of uh, other uh, awards and acknowledgements, Mark is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and a member of the Canadian Association of Physics, and in fact, uh, was just awarded the uh, Life Medal of, for Lifetime Achievement in Physics from the Canadian Association of Physicists. Uh, very notable honor. Uh, he's also been an awardee of the Compton Medal from the Advanced Photon Source, and the Brockhouse Medal, and the, uh, the, uh, the Brockhouse Medal also from the Canadian Association of Physics. So Mark will be speaking about uh, the work that he's really pioneered with coherent scattering and speckle uh, in terms of both the uh, development of the technique, uh, the present status of the technique, and the future of the technique looking at the uh, sources that we have coming online, both in the future with uh, APS upgrade, but also what's currently possible with sources such as NSLS2, uh, which in its own right is extremely exciting. So Mark, welcome and thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for the nice introduction and for the invitation to come here and uh, describe some of the stuff I've been thinking about for a while. I put the talk here, if you're interested, you can come up and ask me about it afterwards. On the conclusion slide, I will also put the website, so you can wait until then to write it down if you want to. This, I've decided this is a sales pitch. <laughs> this is a sales pitch for XPCS, brought to you by Coherence. So I'm going to try and describe some of the results that have come across from APS. Some of them have been, I've been involved with and some of them I haven't been involved with. But what I would want to try to get across to you is the excitement that the XPCS community has about the capabilities that are now available and how they're about to evolve with the new uh, synchrotron lattices and even a little bit with the free electron laser. So I have a long list of collaborators over the years, and there's probably some names that I'm missing. Some of them, like Brian Stevenson, are here. Uh, Larry Lurio uh, has evolved a lot. There's the group in Grenoble that I've been working with, and these are some of my postdocs and uh, graduate students who've worked with me over the years. Right. And so a lot of this stuff has been done in collaboration with them, and we've discussed a lot of these details and things of what's going on. So here's a little outline of my talk. I have to introduce what I, why I'm interested in this. At some level, why we invented Speckle or worked so hard to get Speckle working for this kind of measurements. What is that it is that we measure? This is, in some sense, the most of the talk, which is going to be a summary of what I thought are some of the exciting results and the variation of what's happened over the time. The present is going to be really a list of beam lines, and the future is what's happening in the next little while, in the next five or ten years, we hope. And then I'll draw some conclusions. So, so the type of thing that I'm interested in is sort of how the structure of materials changes in time and how it controls the functional properties of what's going on. So uh, the type of thing, so sort of the physics of non-equilibrium materials or material science, the physics of material science as opposed to material science. Um, I'm not going to actually, I've never looked at aluminum, I've never studied aluminum, but I think this is a really quite a nice example uh, of the kind of problems that material science has been attacking over the last 50 years or so and making a great deal of progress. And this is the name of the paper, Filling and Feeding of Thin-Walled Structures During Gravity Casting. Think beer cans. Beer cans and pop cans are actually very highly technical, sophisticated devices. Think about over, even over your lifetime, right, how thin they've got, how strong they've got, and all of that is just still aluminum, right? So even though it's sort of this everyday material. And here's some of the complexity of what's going on. 
basically we can take aluminum and heat it up to some temperature and quench it down and let it cool. And so here they heated it up to 680, 700, 750, 800, and 850. So, and this is a millimeter scale bar, so this is actually stuff that you can easily see in a microscope or you can just sort of almost see with your eye. And look at the different kinds of structures that happen simply by what temperature you started from. That's part A. Part B is, this is basically looking at this quench as a function of time. And again, you can see how complicated the structure gets simply by just sitting there cooling it and watching it happen. A lot of it's controlled by thermal conductivity because in some sense the walls cool faster than the center and the heat has to diffuse through and that leads to a lot of this property. This is this structure. You can see this is this, this is this, how it developed as a function of time. And so it turns out basically a lot, this is often called microstructure because you see it in a microscope. It's not, it occurs on length scales, typically from nanometers to microns. Here's some antiphase domain walls in copper three gold, which I'll show you a little bit of data from. And the microstructure actually controls most of the properties that we care about in the everyday world as opposed to what's going on. When we give this talk in chemistry departments, I often say the chemical bond to first order is irrelevant because they're all the same. So if you want to break some material, the microstructure controls where it breaks. If it etches or gets corroded, it gets corroded differently at different places in the microstructure, the resistivity, everything. And just the fact that by changing the history of the sample, you can change its microstructure, means it's a non-equilibrium property. And so understanding the statistical mechanics and the thermodynamics of non-equilibrium systems is the physics kind of stuff that I'm interested in. And in some sense, you can sort of see the domain walls and the microstructure are actually sort of fluctuations in the structure of the material. And it's sort of not the average property that matters, it's how you average over these fluctuations. And you can probably believe me a lot that the how, you, how does the system evolve from one state to another state, it basically evolves because these fluctuations get biased to drive it one way versus the other way. So even in equilibrium, these fluctuations are going on, and so being able to look at these fluctuations is the kind of physics, is controlling the physics of what's going on, and that's sort of what we're interested in trying to study. And my colleagues always complain about me showing too many equations, so I'm going to show two slides with equations on it. Not so much because the equations are important, but they remind me of what's important, of what's going on, and it says it much more precisely almost than you can in words. One of the, it's, XPCS really is a spectroscopy. So normally what you would think of, you measure the intensity as a function of frequency of, let's say, the transmitted light. That shows you what the spectrum of what's happening inside the material, and that gives you some idea what the energy levels and stuff are. If you think about it, the intensity of the light is the electric field squared. We can do a little, it's Fourier transform into time. And so you can sort of imagine that there's sort of the correlations in the electric field, which come about because of the scattering off of the material, basically control what the spectrum are. And so it turns out we're not going to measure the spectrum directly. We're going to measure this property here, which is the Fourier transform and frequency of the spectrum. If you know this, you know that. That's the purpose of this equation. And actually what we're going to look at is not the spectrum directly, but we're going to use a trick which makes it easier to measure, which is the intensity-intensity correlation spectrum that we want to look at. So since we do x-ray scattering, the intensity will depend on a certain wave vector, and we can understand how the intensity at that wave vector spreads out in time. Everything scales by the intensity, so we sort of normalize that out. And what we end up measuring is this thing called G2, the correlation function, and it's basically related to the, for most cases, to the Fourier transform of G1, which is the normal spectrum, the normal spectroscopy that we see. So, the purpose of this is just to show you we're basically measuring the frequency spectrum, but we're measuring it in time. <coughs> so let's look at an example. The kind of thing you could imagine that we're interested in is how does the composition change in time? We know roughly what the diffusion equation is. The diffusion equation basically says the rate of change of the composition depends on the gradient squared of the composition. That's Fick's law. How do I tell my students to solve that? Well, let's the Fourier transform in space, and then the equation becomes 
basically diagonalized. That diagonalizes the gradient operator here. And so we can see that it's just a simple exponential decay from this, time, from this equation, and we can solve that. And so we can see the changes, the fluctuations in composition at a certain wavelength, basically, depend on the diffusion constant with this Q squared, and they're basically exponentially decaying. The reason I want to go, th and, and th this got a time constant, and this time constant depends on Q squared. And the reason I want to say that is if you can measure the time constant as a function of wave vector, that's in some sense the Fourier transform of the equation of motion of the system. Okay? Where did that Q squared come from? Well, the Q squared comes from because when you take the gradient squared, that gives you a Q squared. Okay? So this equation of motion leads to this time constant. So one of the powers of XPCS is we can measure the time constant of systems as a function of wave vectors, which is in some sense directly the equation of motion of the system that's going on, and that's what excites us as physicists who want to explain everything quantitatively down to 10 decimal places or something like that. So that's all it is for equations for the moment. So how do we do that? How do we access the fluctuations? Normally, if you do X-ray scattering off of something in equilibrium, you get a pattern. You can analyze the pattern and get information about the structure. I can measure the pattern again. I get the same pattern. I can measure the pattern again, and I get the same pattern, and so you don't get much information about the time evolution of a system in an equilibrium system in normal X-ray scattering. The way we get information is use uh, coherence, use speckle. So if we take a random set of particles, we can Fourier transform and calculate what the scattering looks like, and it looks like this. Now, when a diffraction person looks at this scattering pattern, it sort of sees two length scales. It sees one length scale, which is sort of like the envelope of what's going on. That's a large angle spread, larger angle spread than the sharp features, which you see over here. The large angle spread in scattering means you're looking at small things in real space. So this average scattering looks at the average shape of the particles and what's going on. This high resolution stuff, the sharp stuff, is equal to broad stuff in real space, and it turns out to be related to the interference pattern basically from one edge of the sample to the other edge of the sample. And so that's what this interference pattern is. Now normal incoherent light, basically it's got an angle spread. The angle spread is bigger than the spread caused by the speckles, and so you can't see them. So normal incoherent scattering, you smear out the speckle patterns, and you get the everyday X-ray scattering that everybody is well used to. <coughs> but why do we care? Well, now let's imagine, this is a really just a complicated interference pattern between all the particles. If the particles move, the interference pattern changes. So by measuring the fluctuations in the speckle pattern, we have direct access to the motion of the particles or the thing that's doing the scattering that you're measuring in, in, in time. Okay? So even in equilibrium, we can now measure the time evolution of the scattering due to the fact that in equilibrium, these things are all, let's say, doing Brownian motion, they're all vibrating around, and so this pattern is vibrating in space. And that's what the excitement here is. And in some sense, a speckle experiment, an XPCS experiment, is simply doing a diffraction experiment where the finite size of your sample determines the resolution. So it's a diffraction-limited experiment. That's essentially the same statement as saying, use a coherent beam. I'm not going to tell you how to use a coherent beam or how to get a coherent beam, other than any wave is coherent if you collimate the hell out of it. And so the original experiments consisted of collimating the hell out of it is like using a three micron slit 70 meters from the source. So I'm not going to talk much about that. The real issue is, once you've made it coherent, are there any photons left? And with the new synchrotrons, there are. And so here, we actually did this at NSLS, called it zero here, <laughs> is a speckle pattern taken with x-rays actually off of anti-phase domain walls in copper three gold. And so again, there's two, there's sort of three length scales in this pattern. There's sort of some length scale corresponding to this envelope, which is 2 pi over the domain size in the x direction, and some envelope of this thing, which is 2 pi over the domain sizes um, in the y direction. And then there's the sharp features here, and this is one of the few times where we actually had a high resolution detector and we resolved the speckles. 
Turns out if you want to measure the changes in intensities of the speckles, you just make your detectors equal to the speckle size and that sort of optimizes the experiments that you're doing. So we can see coherent beams, that's what this shows you. So let's look a little bit about where the information comes from. So here, we're going to look at gold particles and polystyrene. Here is the small angle scattering of the gold particles into an area detector. There's a thousand by a thousand x-ray detectors in this CCD image. And so there's like a million x-ray detectors. If, we circ if you average away the speckle, that's what incoherent scattering is. So it doesn't matter how you average away the speckle. We can do it numerically, we can do it by spreading the beam out, we can do it by moving samples and things. But if you average away the speckles, in particular here, this is an isotropic system, if we do circular averages, we get the normal S of Q. And then I think this sample is like this sample. <laughs> <coughs> and now if we move the detector further and further out, we can measure the normal small angle scattering measurement that you would normally think of for an X thing. And here we've done it for four different compositions and four different sets of particles. The main reason I wanted to show this is one of the tricks we had to learn is how do you diffuse gold particles, 60 angstrom gold particles, into polystyrene, a plastic, without them aggravating, aggravating, aggregating, <laughs> okay? And if they aggregate, then you end up seeing a peak at the nearest neighbor distance that's the size of the gold particles like this. So the fact that this is nice and smooth through here basically is a measure of the fact that we've dispersed the gold particles randomly uncorrelated through the system at very low, I think we were looking at, you know, 0.1 volume percent gold particles in polystyrene. And we're, in some sense, wanted to use the gold particles as we can measure the motion of the gold particles with our small angle scattering, and we can use them as a, as a tracer element, as a, as a way of seeing the fluctuations of the polymers. The fluctuations of polymers are interesting and complicated, and I'm not going to talk too much about them today. But now what I can do is I can take all the X-ray detectors in this black arc. They all have the same wave vector magnitude, and because it's isotropic, they all behave the same way in dynamics because everything depended on the magnitude of the wave vector, not the wave vector. So I take all of the detectors in that arc, and I plot them in one line on this graph here. Turns out there's over 20,000 detectors in that arc. And then we take another X-ray measurement, and basically we take 1,000 X-ray measurements, and we basically plot the intensity of the speckle, the intensity of the scattering on, the, at, on each pixel, and here you can directly see the fluctuations that we're after. So this is in some sense the Brownian motion of the gold particles moving around in the uh, polystyrene as Einstein would predict or something, explain or something like that. So we get this noisy pattern and you can sort of see there's the, the speckles are intense and then they decay and then they appear again and there's sort of some average time constant. You might estimate three or four hundred seconds as what the time constant of this thing is. How do I do a more quantitative job? Well, that's where the correlation function comes in. So we take the intensity, this is all the same wave vector magnitude. So we take the intensity at some time, one row, at another time, another row. We multiply them together and calculate the average. If the two rows are very close together, the averages are the same. If it's high, it stays high. If it's low, it stays low. So we even measure the time constants of the low stuff. Okay? We subtract off the average because that sort of normalizes it, and we don't care about the intensity because it's linear in intensity, and we get our G2 function, and if this was Brownian motion, it would have an exponential decay, but now we got a squared because it's that squared. <coughs> and so for simple diffusion, we would just see that. So the reason I'm going through this in sort of a little bit more detail is, so what we could do now is we could take any pair of times. If the two times are close together, then we're close along the diagonal. If the two times are far apart, they're basically uncorrelated, they're far from the diagonal. So simply by looking at the two time correlation function, we can see that the correlation function isn't changing in time as you would expect for equilibrium scattering. Okay? In equilibrium, there's no origin of time, it just depends on time difference. Time difference is how far off the diagonal you are. So if I take one row, I think this white line that you see here is actually this blue data. That's the correlation function for that one set of pixels. There's one pair for everything. 
we get the statistics again because we're able to average over 10 to the fourth speckles and that gives us a good average. So that's the other important point by measuring these areas. So now if we just average this, we get the black line or the red line, there are different ways of doing the averaging. We can see we get the correlation function. We actually get the whole correlation function in several correlation times. We get that because we measure all of the angles or all of the things in, in parallel. And let me again stress, this is just one arc. You know, there's a couple of hundred arcs that we could calculate this for. So again, to give you a feeling for the amount of data. So we can measure the time constant as a function of wave vector directly and get information on the, the equation of motion. Part of the reason I went through this exercise is look at what's happened to this system. This is the copper go three gold system. What we did is we quenched the copper three gold through the phase transition. So now the domains are growing as a function of time. So now this is an explicitly non-equilibrium situation and we figured out a way to get the correlation function and now we see the correlation function grows with time. And so we can actually do non-equilibrium measurements of time constants and the idea of course is most equal, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics theories say that the fluctuations in non-equilibrium behavior are very similar to the fluctuations in equilibrium behavior and so we can see how the structure evolves from one to the other and how the fluctuations evolve from one to the other and learn everything there is to know about material science in principle. So that's what we do. So now I want to do a bunch of examples. I wanted to do a first example in a little more detail than I just did. So a nice simple example is let's look at polystyrene spheres in a liquid. So this really is Brownian motion, okay? And so we basically look at the scattering. We put the origin of the small angle scattering up here so we could measure as far out in Q as we could. And again, if we average over this or we average over time, so we average away all the speckles, so there's not much of a speckle problem on there because we've averaged it away. But this is an equilibrium measurement and the average with no speckles, I mean, you average away the speckles either in time or by doing circular averages. So the first circular averages I want to do are basically here. And what we see are these four curves. So these, the difference in these four curves is simply the concentration of the particles that we put into the liquid, which is glycerol. Why glycerol? Because it's slow. And back in the early days, we didn't have a lot of photons. And so this here, we have nice spheres. So this is essentially the airy function of the spheres because they're at low concentration. They're not interacting. And so they see that. As you go to higher and higher concentrations, so the blue curve here, is actually at 50 volume percent fraction. Half of the stuff is particles and half of the stuff is liquid. It's a very crowded system. And then we begin to see the scattering change of shape because the particles affect each other. How do we understand that? Well, the scattering here has two parts. It has the scattering of the particles and it has a scattering of the structure. So we divide the scattering of the particles, which we measured in the green curve, into all the other curves. And now we can see what the structure factor looks like. So this is simply the liquid structure factor of the positions of the particles that you would measure in an equilibrium scattering measurement. At very low concentrations, there is no correlation. It's like a gas of particles. And as the particles get denser and denser, we begin to see a peak. And we see a peak at 2 pi over the nearest neighbor distances because that's how liquid structure factors work. And as a matter of fact, the black curve is a theory curve is simply the perkis yakovich hard sphere theory of what liquid should look like. And when we do that fit, we can actually get the volume fractions out and they agree quite nicely with the volume fractions of the stuff that we made. So this is just simple small angle scattering from 50 or 100 years ago, some level. But at each one of these curves, we have a correlation function because we measured it many, many times. And so at low concentrations, we see here's two different wave vectors we can see the correlation function. At high concentrations, we can see uh, a different structure. As a matter of fact, due to the structure, there's, this is a little more complicated correlation function than this. And what we can do is at the moment, let's say, this, let's look at the correlation time at the beginning. And we can then plot up the correlation time as a function of wave vector to see what the equation of motion of the system looks like. If everything is gas-like, there is no correlations and there is the equation of motion is simply the ballistic motion of the particles and we see 
So we can actually normalize it by the Einstein-Stoke relation. If we have particles and we know the viscosity and we know the radius, we can calculate the diffusion constant and that's what D naught is. So we can basically take our measured diffusion constant, which in some sense is the slope as a function of wave vector, and compare it to the diffusion constant that we measure and we can see here and as we get more and more concentrated, we see a deviation from Einstein-Stokes law. What is it? Well, this QR here turns out to be where the peak in the structure factor is. So what is the structure factor measuring? It's measuring how closely packed the particles are. If the particles are, are packed together, they move slower. And so the time constant gets longer. And so the structure of this gives us some information about how the particles move through each other as a function of whatever. It's got a very fancy name because it was figured out by Dijen for molecular scattering and atomic scattering liquids way back when. As the time constant gets longer, the frequency spectrum gets sharper, so this is Dijen narrowing. So this is actually measuring the sharpening of the frequency spectrum of the particles. If we take an exponential in your Fourier transform, you get a Lorentzian. The Lorentzian power spectrum is what you expect for thermal motion. Okay. So that's the same statement. So that's what we're excited about. That's what we can do. And this is some sense was the proof of principle example where we knew the answer, well, mostly. Okay? And there's actually some physics is what this ratio is. And I'm not going to talk about that. So I thought I'd mention some of the early papers. So one of the first papers we did is in 1990. That was 1991 was the speckle pattern. 1995 was this where we looked at critical dynamics and had indications of correlation functions in iron-3 aluminum. We looked at the, uh, somebody looked at gold particles in glycerol before the, the examples that I showed you. Here's par palladium particles in a, in a polymer uh, at a little bit later date. Here's another example. This is actually, I think, one of the first papers to come out of APS at our beamline at Sector 8 about looking at the non-equilibrium behavior of phase separation in glasses. Okay, so again, this is a non-equilibrium thing. And here's some other things, and some of them you include comparing X-ray scattering to light scattering. Light scattering has a problem that you have to index match. Light scatters too well, and so it's very difficult, whereas X-rays are always single scattering, and so the Fourier transform of the density basically gives you the X-ray scattering, and so it's easy to interpret, and that's why we like it. X-rays probe shorter length scales, and so if we had enough photons, we can do a better job with X-ray scattering than with light scattering. And basically, what I've been talking about, again, is, you know, what the light scattering people would call dynamic light scattering, or photon correlation spectroscopy. That's exactly what they do in DLS. And here again is a non-equilibrium case. Now, you may sort of say, well, you know, 1991, what's the time? Well, what happened here is this is one of the first experiments done at ESRF when there was only one beam line. Okay, so what happened between the first experiment at Brookhaven and this experiment and these experiments was ESRF came online and APS came online and then we had a no more coherent photons and we could begin to do these measurements. Plus, although the experiment is simple, a diffraction limited X-ray scattering experiment, getting the optics right and getting all the details right took us a while to sort out in time. And the, programs to analyze the data. So here's a couple of examples that I've chosen to be representative of what's been measured in the last 17 years in some sense. So this is a relatively new example. Actually here, they went up to, at, this is done at ESRF, they went up to 21 keV, very high energy, so they could penetrate into a silicon uh, substrate which had channels cut into it. So now the particles are confined into small channels and we want to look at how the Brownian motion of the particles is affected under, during confinement. And again, because we can measure X-ray structure, we can see this is not nice and isotropic, so there's an anisotropy simply because we've confined the particles into a confined geometry similar to the size of the particles. We can measure the time constants. The time constants, this is like this Dijen narrowing I was showing you before, but it changes depending on the direction that you look at because you know, it depends on whether you're going perpendicular to or parallel to the channels of, of what's going on. So again, we can sort of see this kind of behavior, simple colloids. This is an experiment, uh, I'll get the references next, where basically what we did is we took what we did, what was done, it wasn't me, two polymers which are very similar. 
and we mixed them together. The reason we took two polymers is so we had enough contrast to do x-ray scattering. And then by looking at the correlation functions, we get information about the motion of the polymers themselves directly, pretty directly. And so here you can see how the time constant varies versus wave vector. And you can see there's a fast component and a slow component. And basically, this theory that describes this is consistent with uh, reptation, which is the way polymers, they can't sort of go through each other. They have to go longitudinally. And so this is some of the data showing that polymers have a different kind of equilibrium fluctuations than normal fluids. <coughs> Any diffuse scattering works. So if you go to a liquid and you look, it has a surface, you can do surface sort of x-ray reflectivity, glancing incident stuff. And if the surface is rough, you'll see diffuse scattering due to the waves on top of the surface. So you can measure the time constants the capillary waves of a polymer thin films on top of other thin films. That's work that's done here. And we can see, we can see time constants over very large decades of time. You know, here's from one second to a thousand seconds. And basically, there was a set of papers where they said, well, very thin polymer films have a glass transition that can get depressed by hundreds of degrees. But these measurements use very thin films. They found that all of the data can collapse onto a universal curve using simply the theory of viscosity of capillary waves in thin films, and that there didn't seem to be any anomalousness in the viscosity. Something else is going on in those other measurements. And again, just to sort of point out, there's lots of thicknesses, there's lots of things, and basically the scaling, which you get from the equation of motion, shows all of the data ever taken at sector eight falls on this universal curve, which we understand in great detail they understand in great detail. Again, it's not my work. <coughs> Who needs to do small angle scattering? Let's go to large angle scattering. Large angle scattering is harder. I would say for material science, it's actually more informative. And so we should try and do it more and more now that we have more coherence. But here, they're basically looking at a quasi-crystal. A quasi-crystal have these face lips called phasons that have to do with the incommensurateness of the quasi-crystal behavior. And so this isn't actually Q squared. This is the phason Q, which is how far away you are from the incommensurate, from the underlying semi-commensurate Bragg peak. And you can see the time constant goes like Q squared. So right away we know those phasons are diffusing. This is unambiguous because we measured the equation of motion. And so there's this work here. Uh, another set of things that were done here. Um, is to look at the correlation functions of sort of domain wall intersections in chromium. It's actually magnetic, but there's still a structural aspect to it. They can measure the correlation functions. It's got this sort of interesting shape. An interesting thing to do is you can sort of see the time constant saturates at very low temperatures. Okay? They argue that that's zero point motion that's happening at low temperatures. It seems like a good argument. So again, it gives you quite a lot of insight into what's happening in the dynamics of these systems, even basically in equilibrium. And here's, in some sense, a real tour de force. So this is looking at the diffuse scattering between the Bragg peaks of copper 90, gold 10. It's an order disorder. The atoms are hopping around because of diffusion and basically the temperature that was measured. I don't even know what the temperature is in this set of data. And they went sort of, these are sort of residuals a little bit of the Bragg peak, and they measured this stuff in here. And you can see the time constant has this oscillatory nature. So you can take a model of simple particles hopping. You can calculate what the diffusion constant looks like at these relatively small length scales, which is large wave vector scales. These are, you know, things like inverse hours. <laughs> the time constant is a real tour de force to measure these things. And the blue curve basically says the hopping is nearest neighbor, and, there's, and the green curve is what you would expect if there was a next nearest neighbor hopping as well. And it, basically this data shows directly that it's just nearest neighbor hopping out here at these high wave vectors. And uh, gives you a lot of details on the mechanism of the diffusion in this particular system. And let's go back to our copper three gold. I showed you already a little bit some of these two time correlation functions. Copper three gold has an order disorder phase transition. We quench through the phase transition. In the high temperature phase, the 1.0 Bragg peak is forbidden, so there's no intensity. At low temperatures, the one old Bragg peak grows into a Bragg peak. It's eventually a diffuse peak due to the antiphase domain walls. That's the speckle pattern that I showed you 
at the very beginning. We can look at the two-time correlation function. We can see how it grows. We can actually, this number up here is in some sense a measure of our resolution of our spectrometer. There's no physics in it. It's the contrast. It has something to do with how coherent our beam is, nothing to do with the sample. The only thing that has to do with the sample as we take these cross sections, because everything is normalized away, is the time constant. It's the width of that curve. So all of these are fit to a functional form that we predicted theoretically from dynamical scaling. And there's one time constant for every slice. We can plot that time constant up for each slice. We can scale it by the wave vector scaling we expect for dyna uh, reno uh, dynamic renormalization group uh, type calculations. Okay, in this particular case, things get spread out rather than collapse because small Qs are large times and big Qs are fast times. And so we can take all the time constant that we measure, scale it in the appropriate way, and we can see how that scaling function works as a function of time. At early times, the center of the peak is what's dominating and things are linear in time. At late times, basically, it's got a time constant which is 1 minus Z for the aficionados who know where Z is the critical exponent for time, which in this case turns out to be 1 minus a half, which is a half, so you can't really tell. But if we did the case for a conserved order parameter where it's 1 minus a third and it's 2 thirds, then we get the same sort of result. So again, I want to show you, this has a lot of information on the mechanisms by which domain walls and copper 3 gold are evolving as, as you quench through the phase transition. Here's another example we came across. We wanted to look at the phase transition. I'm interested in phase transitions. That's where a lot of the non-equilibrium properties come from. You quench through a phase transition to control the microstructure and stuff. This is simple cobalt. Cobalt has a face-centered cubic to a hexagonal close-packed cubic, uh, hexagonal close-packed lattice phase transition. We go and look at, I believe we were looking at roughly the 002 peak, which corresponds to the 111 peak of the FCC lattice. And what we see is this is a line out of the speckle pattern. And what we saw here is every once in a while there'd be a good discontinuous, a very fast change in the structure of the microstructure. Our picture is the microstructure is a bunch of domain walls, which is like an elastic foam network. Every once in a while it goes snap, and the foam rearranges itself into a new structure. It's like an avalanche, okay? And so we looked at the statistics of the separation of these things here, we sort of looking at diffuse scattering slightly off the Bragg rods. And we can basically plot up the distribution of times between avalanches, and it agrees with the power law that you would predict for earthquakes and various things like that. So again, this is a completely different kind of information we're getting from the same measurement, which is XPCS. <coughs> and really beautiful experiment done by the group at ESRF is here, where they're basically looking at a metallic glass. So they heat the metallic glass up to some temperature where the viscosity is sort of becoming real and measurable. And basically what they see is when they do the two-time correlation function, again, you see this intermittent dynamic. So the glass is sort of hops, gets into some local thing, and then it changes its hops, and you get lots of information about how the glass transition is evolving and what's going on. And this is work in progress, but you can sort of see that at high temperatures, Sorry, at low temperatures, you see this intermittent dynamics as the strain builds up and relaxes and builds up and relaxes, is our picture, is their picture. And at high temperatures, everything is much more like continuously evolving uh, constantly in time with a single time constant. And I'm not going to talk a lot about this, this is, this is, but this is a picture that was on the poster. So far, I've been looking at how does the speckle fluctuate in time? How does the intensity fluctuate in time? We're diffractionists. The scattering pattern has information about the structure. Where is that information? How do we look at it? How, we don't want to just normalize it away. So it turns out you can sort of think of each little speckle as a little Bragg peak. And what happens if you take a crystal with Bragg peaks and strain it? The Bragg peaks move. Okay, and so you can measure the strain quite accurately by measuring the Bragg peaks. How sharp the Bragg peaks are is how accurately you can measure the strain. So every single speckle here, in some sense, is a little Bragg peak. So what we did is we took little squares. We calculated how far the speckle shifted from one time to the next time. Uh, so that's two times, two patterns, two times, one time, or two times. And basically, we plotted up the shift of the speckle of the Bragg peak 
multiplied by 200 in order to get an arrow that you could see, and then we plotted it back on self, on top of each self. Okay? And so here, uh, what you're seeing is, in some sense, this is a, a, a rubber material, so we're getting the small angle scattering from the carbon black in the rubber. We, it's viscoelastic, so we stretched it. We held it at a constant strain, and now the viscosity is changing in time because it's viscoelastic. And so it's flowing. We stretch it, it starts flowing along the direction of the strain. That means it comes in from the other sides. And so this flow pattern is the stretch in the direction we stretched it. It's the sides coming in. And so this turns out to be the strain field inside our diffraction volume of our piece of rubber. Since the size of the beam was 20 microns, we basically have a sub-micron measurement of the strain matrix, <laughs> at least in projection of 2D. So that's a little bit what's happening here. And it turns out we can calculate what that is from a homogeneous distortion of the material. So that's where we are. That's the kind of things we're doing. There's a lot more stuff going on out there, but I hope you got a good feeling for the kind of things we can measure, why we're excited about this, what can happen. We can measure both in equilibrium and non-equilibrium and get lots of detailed information. So what's the present? Well, the present really is, where can I go do these experiments? Because they're set up to do it. And basically, at the moment, there are five beam lines. There's the Troika beam line at ESRF. There's Sector 8 here at APS. There's a beam line that does this sometimes at Spring 8. And then there's the Petra P10 beam line at uh, Daisy in Hamburg, Germany. And the brand new system on the, uh, the brand new game in the system is basically at NSLS2 has a beam line dedicated to doing these kind of measurements called the CHX beam line. These guys are fairly equivalent. They have an incident beam intensity when you sort of work it all out, give or take a factor of 10, of 10 to the 10th photons per second. That's sort of currently where we are. This is approximately 10 times better. And theoretically, it should be 10 times better. It's basically a three or four times better at the moment and while they're still building up. And so, what has been the limitations of what's going on? One of the limitations we've had is to go faster and faster, we needed faster detectors. Essentially now we've got faster detectors and so that limitation has sort of disappeared. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. At small angle scattering, because it's the path length difference, we can use large volumes of materials. We can use millimeter thick materials. And so therefore it's easier, there's a lot more photons in doing small angle scattering than large angle scattering. To do large angle scattering, the coherence condition is much more stringent, 100 times more stringent. And so once we get the new MBA lattice, we will be able to do what we can at small angle scattering, at large angle scattering. And I have a feeling that will revolutionize material science because of the kinds of questions we can now answer. So that to me is the most exciting thing of what's going on, the future. Well, there's two things in the future. One you already know about. This is the current, this is the proposed new beam line for the APS after the MBA upgrade. The MBA upgrade can give us as much as a factor of 100 in coherence. Turns out the time resolution for these things, because things go like intensity squared, is goes like the square of the intensity, the brilliant intensity. So a factor of 100 in time resolution gives us theoretically a fraction of, fraction of 10 to the fourth in time resolution. So we can go from several milliseconds down to microseconds and probably even to nanoseconds with a little bit of work and tricks, okay? So that's really quite an exciting thing and we're looking forward. Plus, we'll be able to do the kind of measurements we want at wide angles as well as at small angles because that's what also this higher brilliance does. So that'll be revolutionary. That's one of the more exciting things of coming up, 10 to the 13 photons or 10 to the 12 photons instead of 10 to the 10. The other thing, of course, that's happening that you all know about is free electron lasers. Free electron lasers, they're a little bit more difficult to think about how to do an XPCS measurement because in some sense we want to measure as a function of time as fast as we can what the scattering looks like. And the original X, uh, uh, XFEL at Stanford would only give you a pulse every 10 milliseconds, 100 hertz. So that would be the fastest time constant you could measure. It would be a real pain. So we came up with this mechanism by what if we could take a, make a pulse splitter, so we could take this pulse and split it into two parts and time delay one part with respect to the other part by making it travel a longer distance. 
every uh, nanosecond is 30 centimeters, and so that's quite straightforward to get nano, sub-nanosecond resolution. So now we have two pulses. The first pulse comes and hits our sample, causes a speckle pattern. The second pulse, time delayed, comes and hits our sample and creates another speckle pattern. If the structure didn't change, the two speckle patterns reinforce and the speckle pattern looks like a single pulse speckle pattern. But if the structure has changed, you could imagine the speckle pattern of the second one no longer lines up with the speckle pattern of the first one. And so by measuring the contrast, we can see how the speckle pattern varies in time. So simply by changing the time delay and doing measurements, time delay, do measurement, we could measure out this correlation function. And that's, why is that exciting? Because the width of the pulse at the synchrotron, at the FEL, can be like 75 femtoseconds. So that means the first time point in your correlation function can be less than 100 femtoseconds. And so now we can measure correlation functions down to the speed of phonons, or the vibrate the periods of phonons and things, and so that would be a very interesting thing to do. Can we do it? Well, we've already done the preliminary first step, I would say, maybe even the second step. So we took liquid gallium, we put it in the beam, we took a pulse from the free electron laser, and we measured the speckle pattern from that pulse. So the fact that we see a speckle pattern means we froze the motion of liquid gallium in 75 femtoseconds. Okay? If it had vibrated a lot, the contrast would be wrong. Okay? Now we did lots of pulses, <laughs> and it's a little tricky to... We also uh, attenuated the X-ray, uh, the FEL beam, don't tell the people at Slack, because the raw beam would melt our sample. So we also showed that we could attenuate the beam enough that we basically didn't really change the temperature of our sample and still measure the speckle pattern. And that's a little bit, believe it or not, a static speckle pattern taken from liquid gallium many, many times. Each data point, each row here is one pulse of the, secret of the X FEL. Every pulse has a slightly different intensity, so that's what this intensity scale is. And what you see at the bottom is basically a solid curve that's what Poisson statistics would predict. The speckle pattern violates Poisson statistics. It bunches up, so you get more fluctuations than you would from Poisson statistics. That's what a speckle pattern is about. The top line is what you would measure if you had perfect coherence. You know, that's basically Bose-Einstein statistics. And what we measure is somewhere in between. It's a third of the way in between because our contrast factor was equivalent to a third. And we can see it in the two pulse. So in some sense, we're, the issue is we see an excess of pixels with two counts versus those that have one count. That's how we measure the deviation from Poisson. It's a little bit challenging, but it's done. And for three pulses and four pulses, everything becomes much more. So again, this is going to be quite exciting when we get the proper pulse delays and things working at the FEL, where we can basically do sub-picosecond down to maybe even 10 femtosecond type XPCS. We're quite excited about that. And this is one last comment. Part of what we've been limited by is the coherence. Part of what we've been limited by is our detectors. So here's Moore's law. Here's how good computers are, which is essentially how good detectors are. And here's how they've been changing with time. It's actually quite amusing to plot on top of that the quality of our coherence of our X-rays. And so you can see that the X-rays are far outpacing the technology of building things. I like to point this out to detector people and to various people because basically what it has meant for our experiments is that the electronics is lagging behind our capability of doing the experiment. So we have been limited by our detectors. And there are now new detectors which are just about on the market that are coming that maybe I could not I could stop crying for a better detector. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> okay? But basically, that's what the purpose of that is. And one of the things that I've been quite I've been involved with, not so much in the design of the detector, but in showing how well it works, here's the VPIC detector, which was a prototype 64 by 64 pixel area detector that measures, actually does 3D vertical integration when it makes the stuff, so it's sort of a new way of making VLSI. And we were able to basically synchronize it to the pulses in 24 bunch mode. And so this is uh, the intensity of the open circles is basically we measured the intensity of every bunch as it went around the ring. 
okay? And every 24 bunches, we go back to the same bunch, and so we actually averaged over many cycles of the ring, but we can actually see the intensity pattern of each of the bunches. They vary by a few percent, three or four percent from bunch to bunch in 24 bunch mode, and the machine physicist actually tells us what that is, and that's what the black dots are. And so we actually could read out faster than the spacing between 24 bunch mode pixels. That would be the ideal XPCS detector if we can get that working up at higher areas and higher and uh, higher data put, data throughputs. So anyway, so that's probably a good place for me to stop. Here's my conclusions. Again, here's where the talk is. I started by demonstrating the speckle pattern in some sense from NSLS, a static speckle pattern that got us excited. I finished by showing you a static speckle pattern from liquid gallium, which has also got us quite excited. It sort of sets the scale for where we can go and how we can get there. I tried to, you know, emphasize the physics, the microstructure, its kinetics, and the thermal fluctuations, and the non-equilibrium fluctuations. That's the physics and the material science that I care about and that's really interesting. And this technique is perfectly suited for doing that. Again, you measure the structure as a function of time, that tells you what the equation of motion of the system is, that tells you all you need to know to understand the material better and better, and hopefully design new materials and stuff. Okay? The new synchrotrons basically all have beamlines now to do this kind of measurement. The upgrade will give us another factor of 100, which will revolutionize yet again our ability to do XPCS measurements. The split pulse thing even does it in a different way. It's a completely different beast but it actually has the possibility, essentially demonstrated, of getting sub-picosecond time resolution. And I showed you a little bit, there's a lot of information in this speckle pattern that we were ignoring, that I haven't talked about. I talked a little bit about the QQ correlations when I talked about the strain and the rubber to give you a tantalizing insight as to what's potentially possible and what's going on, okay? We also developed some heterodyne techniques and some various sets of things. So we're working on being able to explore in more detail the structural information in our diffraction pattern. Now you may or may not know, there is this technique using coherence called coherent diffraction imaging. So in principle, if you have a very coherent beam and you measure it very carefully, you can basically measure the speckle pattern. You can then invert the speckle pattern because there's a unique phase for every speckle pattern and so therefore you can build an x-ray microscope. So the speckle pattern, in principle, has all the information about the structure of the material. And in some cases, that's the thing to look for, and that's the thing to do, and that's all this excitement about coherent diffraction imaging. But in material science, we probably want the statistics and the average and the probability distributions. And so we don't need to work that hard, and we can measure much faster this partial coherence patterns and partial pieces of the information rather than measuring the whole 3D speckle pattern with a resolution of parts per 10 to the 6 that's required for doing CDI. And so that's probably a good place to stop. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions for Mark? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yep. Right. No. <laughs> um, let's go back to that. That strain pattern came from two images taken at some time apart, every five images or something. We can go, so we can go to, that's actually every three apart. We can go to every six apart. The distortion is bigger because it's moving. So if we take the strain, that's the position, that's the shift of things, divide by time, we get the velocity. So actually what we're measuring is the velocity tensor of the distortion of the velocity across our sample. That's what a time-dependent strain is. Yeah, so this is the strain at one time. This is the strain at a later time. Okay. No. <laughs> 
We are at such a small strain. These are very small strains. Again, delta Q over Q is, well, there it is. <laughs> so this, the distortion of the scattering pattern, you know, what would be really interesting is as you distort, as you get bigger and bigger strains, the actual isotropic scattering pattern changes to an anisotropic thing. So we're much more sensitive than that. In principle, right, what is a diffraction limited speckle? It's 2 pi over the size of the region dis diffracting, which is 20 microns. So we're doing Q resolution with 2 pi over 20 microns resolution. That's how big a shift we can measure. We can actually measure fractions of that. Chris. Right. Of course, the x-rays can affect the system. <laughs> yes, that's, a, that's something we worry in great detail. Not as much as you guys do who do imaging. <laughs> um, to first order, we're getting a coherent beam. How do you get a coherent beam? You collimate the hell out of it. So our actually fluxes are actually a lot less than the fluxes in normal x-ray beams first, okay? We do know when we put soft matter polymers and stuff in our beam, it will radiation damage. We can see radiation damage in two ways. We can basically look at how the structure changes as a function of time due to the radiation-induced stretches, and so we know that's too long. Turns out our correlation functions are even more sensitive, so we can measure the correlation function sort of as a function of x-ray dose, and we can calculate at what x-ray dose it is that we get uh, radiation damage and just make sure we ignore that. If we want to go slower, we just attenuate, okay? So that we know something like, I don't know, pick a number, 10 to the 12 photons is what causes radiation damage in our setup, okay? So if we can take the 10 to the 12 photons and do it in a microsecond, we just stop measuring after a microsecond, we can measure dynamics from the pulse structure up to microseconds, okay? Or we can attenuate the beam if we need to and have that happen over four hours and we can measure time constants over four hours. And I don't know if you picked up on this, I didn't really point it out maybe like I should have. Most of our time axes are logarithmic. We care about the dynamics from microseconds to hours, okay? What makes a polymer a polymer? What's, you know, what's a soft material a soft material? It's squishy, it's slow. <laughs> so if you want to know the intrinsic dynamics of what's going on, in some sense, you've got to measure the slow stuff because that's aging, that's how plastic ages, that's creep in materials, that's an interesting time scale set by the sample, not by us. Does that answer your question? Clear as mud. <laughs> Right. I think that's, that's, that's a potential, yeah, that's an interesting set of things. We can do that in two ways. I mean, I've been doing time-resolved scattering since I was born, <laughs> at least in, since 1980. And um, I, um, and there, again, what we found is that the time evolution actually is less sensitive to things. If you're doing small angle scattering, you try to invert the small angle scattering pattern, and there's a million theories, and it's sensitive to nothing and everything, and so it's really hard to interpret in great detail what the small angle scattering pattern does, okay? But if you look at the part of the small angle scattering that's changing in time, that's less constrictive. And you can actually infer a lot more of what's going on by looking at the dynamics than at the pure structure. So what we did there is we measured the incoherent scattering at the beginning and the end, and you measured the evolution and inferred stuff. And so the same thing would work with CDI at each end. That's a good way to, to work on these things. If you can convince your... The reason we did this in incoherent scattering and these various other things, every once in a while a structure would appear and disappear. So, there was a, so then it was very hard to freeze it in. And so that's allowed us to monitor when structures appeared and disappeared and how they did that. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>